Well, if you would join me in Psalm 110. Psalm 110, which, as Stuart said, is an ascension passage. And we are going to spend our time uh, this evening uh, looking briefly at truth where the Father said to the Son, please remain seated. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. As some of you know, Lebo has been in the Joburg Gen the last three days being treated for pneumonia. And so for the last few days, Jill and Katie have been taking turns spending the afternoon or spending the night there with her. And this morning as I took Jill early to the hospital to leave her there and to bring Katie home so she could get some sleep, as I walked into the, to the ward, they just had shift change. And I was amazed to hear these sisters singing together at the front desk, God is holy. Later I told Katie what I'd heard and she said that actually when they first came, she said that they gathered together and one of the sisters read from the book of Isaiah. And she said, Dad, she said, then this lady who read from Isaiah began to pray, and she said words in effect this, Lord, in this passage we read that you promise health and blessings. Therefore, we know that each of these children will be healthy. We also know that you will give to each of us health and wealth and success. And Katie lamented that well-meaning people, even well-meaning Christians, can often time be so wrong. I want to believe that all of those children in the ward will fully recover. And how I pray, of course, that that will be the case for Lebo. But the reality is that perhaps some of those children will never recover. While waiting for the lift the other day, a lady was speaking to me and um, after you're there a while, they kind of recognize you. It was funny, yet today I was walking in and this lady said, are you visiting, who are you visiting? I said, I'm visiting my child. And she looked at me and she said, how old? And I said, seven months. <laughs> and she just looked at me like, and as I said to Chris Wannapel today, I wanted to say to her, have you not read the story of Abraham? <laughs> but as I was waiting at the lift, this lady said, how is your baby doing? And I said, she seems to be uh, making progress. And then she said these words rather bluntly, but true. She said, well, at least she's still alive. Because for some parents, their babies, babies are going to die. For some Christians, their loved ones will not recover from their illness. For some Christians, they will remain unemployed. For some Christians, they will never enjoy health. For some churches, they will continue to be maligned rather than vindicated. For some Christians, persecution will lead to their death. For some Christians, poverty will be their lot. For some Christians, broken relationships will remain shattered, even though Jesus Christ has ascended. And this evening, I want to just spend really briefly some time in Psalm 110, being careful to understand what the ascension means and what it doesn't mean for us right now. The danger is like that very sincere lady who read Isaiah is, Isaiah does talk about God bringing healing, but it also talks about God bringing judgment. 
We can't cherry pick when it comes to Scripture, including the doctrine of the ascension. So on this ascension day, I want to help us understand something about what Psalm 110 promises us about the ascension of Jesus Christ. The ascension, as we just read in Acts 1, it's vital. Uh, The ascension day is a very important day for Christians. It's a very important day because there's a real sense without the ascension, there'd be no salvation. Because Jesus Christ, at the right hand of the Father, is interceding for his people. And he's going to do so until we are completely saved. Until the redemption of our body. The ascension is a rich doctrine. It's a rich truth. But I want to, tonight, help us to understand that if we're not careful in the day and age in which we live, we can come to the doctrine of the ascension with a wrong view of what that means for us, much like those who've been studying in Mark chapter 8 had a wrong view of Jesus Christ at his first coming. You remember that, as we've been looking at over and over again, we'll see this again this Sunday morning, in Mark chapter 8 they had a triumphalistic view of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come to earth and he's going to conquer all their enemies. They didn't factor in the parts of Isaiah that talked about the fact that he would be crucified, that he would be killed. Jesus Christ came, first of all, to be crucified before he would ever be crowned. Jesus did not give to the first century Jews what they wanted, but he did give to them what they needed. They needed his death and his burial and his resurrection. Jesus Christ, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, is Lord in Christ. He is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. He rules, he reigns. He established his kingdom, which is worldwide, and therefore he is king over all and everyone and everything. He made that clear upon his resurrection when he said, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth, therefore disciple the nations. But because we believe that Jesus Christ is king... Because our conviction concerning the fact that he is in a position of honor and authority at the right hand of the Father, sometimes that can confuse us. Sometimes that can frustrate us. Because the fact that we believe he has all authority, we find ourselves rather impatient about the advancement of his kingdom. After all, if he has all authority in heaven and earth, why aren't more people being saved? Why aren't more churches being planted? Why are they not growing larger and larger? We realize that Jesus Christ is king and that he's ruling and reigning. We may find ourselves impatient that he doesn't answer all of our prayers, especially our prayers for justice, our prayers for a righteous nation led by righteous leaders. We might find ourselves confused that our church is so far from being practically holy. And a thousand other frustrations can assault our faith We can become confused why Jesus doesn't just roll up his sovereign shirt sleeves and come and just conquer and bring glory to himself and good to all of his people. We want Jesus, the king, to respond to us like we are the king's kids. We want what we want and we want it now. We have a good motive for this. We want to see our suffering brothers and sisters around the world that we prayed for this Sunday night. We want to see them delivered. We urgently want Jesus Christ to be honored in a world that blasphemes his name and that ignores his supremacy. We want a conquering king, and we want that now, now. Not just now, but now, now. Psalm 110, I think, helps us understand something about the fact that that is a promise but we must wait for it. Psalm 110 is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament. 27 times Psalm 110 is referenced in in the New Testament. Because it's a great psalm telling us that Jesus Christ is King. Tonight I want to help us to understand what happened when the Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand. There's a real sense what he was saying to the Son was, please remain seated. Please remain seated. In verse 1, we have the Son's powerful rule. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The right hand uh, spoke of a place of honor. It spoke of a a, a position of authority. 
It spoke of a position of, of power. And if you notice in, in your Bibles, the Lord, those are all capitals. It's Yahweh says to my Lord, and that is Adonai. It's, by the way, Psalm 110 is a purely messianic psalm. When we studied Psalm 22, Easter weekend, we saw that it was referencing David's personal experience, but also prophesying Jesus Christ. Psalm 110 is completely about Jesus Christ. There's no King David here. David's simply writing and saying, the Lord says to my Lord, I'm king, but he says to my king, sit at my right hand when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And after 40 days on the earth with his disciples, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And the Father said, Son, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. Notice the word until. Jesus is to remain seated until a particular time when all the enemies, all of his enemies are conquered. They're either conquered by the gospel, by the way, or they'll be conquered one day by his wrath. But he's saying, son, please remain seated until I make your enemies your footstool. Do you remember reading in Acts chapter 7 about the first martyr in church history? Stephen. And Stephen is, is, is being stoned and put to death. And he looks up into heaven and he sees Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father, right? No. Standing. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And there's a lot of different ideas about why is he standing. Because here, the Father says to him, sit at my right hand. And now we have Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Some say that he was standing to welcome home the church's first martyr. Others say that he was standing because Psalm 110 hasn't been fulfilled. That is, he's standing because judgment hasn't come upon Jerusalem, and maybe even upon the entire world, and then the Father's going to say, sit. I don't know all the reasons why Jesus was standing, but I, as I read that passage, I, I think about the fact that Jesus Christ loves his bride. If somebody were to attack my bride, I would not remain seated. I would be standing and I'd want to do something about that. My wife, by the way, can, can handle herself pretty well. She's proved that at the Joburg Gen this week. Woe be to those young doctors who have to take two or three times to get that IV in. But I wouldn't remain seated if my bride was attacked. And I wonder if Jesus wasn't standing because Jesus was ready to vindicate those who belong to him. I don't know if that would be the case. But certainly in Psalm 110, the Father is saying to the Son, sit at my right hand for a time until I make your enemies your footstool. We long for the day for the last part of this psalm where Jesus Christ returns, where he returns to earth and he executes judgment among the nations. We long for the day when Jesus Christ will return and he will make everything right. He will right all the wrongs. He will take care of all the injustices. We long for that. But we need to wait for that. Because Jesus Christ is on a divine timetable. He is king. He is ruling, and he is reigning, but it doesn't mean that all of our enemies in whatever form they are right now are going to be put under his footstool right now. We may have to just live with them. We have to live with the enemy of illness. We have to live with the enemy of disease. We have to live with the enemies that persecute the church we have, to, we have to live with all those things. But, but we take encouragement looking up and realizing that Jesus is in a place of authority. That Jesus Christ has all things under control. The Father has said to him, remain seated. There's coming a day where you can stand. And there's coming a day you can return for your bride. But in the, in the meanwhile, remain seated. We say, Doug, how does that encourage us? Well, the rest of the psalm makes it very, very clear that though Jesus Christ is seated, Jesus Christ is not inactive. Look at the next verse. The Lord sends forth, this is Yahweh, this is the Father, sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, the scepter of Jesus, 
rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. I can't expound all of that tonight. But in a nutshell, what David is writing about here is that Yahweh is saying to the Son, I want to honor you. Remain seated. But though you're seated here, your kingdom is going to advance. He says here that the Father takes responsibility for this. He says, the Lord sends forth, that's Yahweh sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter. Most commentators have interpreted that, I think rightly so. That this is a spiritual rule of Jesus Christ. He has a powerful rule from the right hand of the Father, but he also has a spiritual rule. And he rules through the gospel. He rules through the word. And it's the Father who is going to empower the word of God to go forth. And as it goes forth, many of these who are his enemies will be conquered. They will offer themselves freely to Jesus Christ as they are converted. Jesus Christ has all power, and he is seated in the right hand of the Father. But he's very, very active, even though he is seated. Through the gospel, enemies are being conquered. God, I would remind you, is on a timetable. And Jesus Christ will return one day. But in the meantime, even though we don't see always all the injustices righted, and we don't see all of our prayers answered the way we'd like to see them answered, and even though we don't see everything turning out as we see the promises in the Word of God eventually that are going to happen, in all of this realize that Jesus Christ is at work through the gospel. The people are being converted. His enemies are being conquered. You know, you think about this, if it's true that Jesus was standing, as it were, to come and to vindicate his people when Stephen was martyred, it's a good thing that Jesus Christ sat back down. Because if Jesus Christ had returned, there were a whole lot of people chosen before, the, and this is hypothetical, but chosen before the foundation of the world that wouldn't yet be converted. When Peter writes about mockers, about Jesus Christ not returning, he, said, he reminds us that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. And Peter is writing to suffering Christians saying, be patient. God's timetable is perfect. Yes, you might have to suffer now, but you're suffering now. And we're, and we're waiting for the return of Jesus. But while we suffer, God is busy saving a people unto himself. Jesus Christ is seated, but he is active. The Father wants Jesus to receive all of his reward. And so he sends forth this scepter of the gospel with great power. The people will be saved in our day. The ascension of Jesus Christ is a guarantee that his kingdom is advancing, advancing that his church will be built. He goes on in verse 4. And speaks about the priestly rule of Jesus Christ. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here we speak of, David speaks of Melchizedek, who we meet in the early chapters of Genesis. Melchizedek was a priest king. Hebrews refers to him often. And, 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 and without getting into all the details of this, this is, this is a, a statement about Jesus Christ who is the priest king. And what David is seeing here is the father has sworn he will not change his mind that Jesus Christ has a priestly reign that is forever. And thank God for that because Jesus ascended to the right hand of the father means he's in a place of intercession and we could sing tonight before the throne of God above. And I forgot all the words. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest whose name is love, whoever pleads for me. Jesus Christ may be seated. And sometimes we want him to stand. And we want him to come and to deliver us from our enemies. But the fact of the matter is, his remaining seated at the right hand of the Father, actually, he's delivering us from our greatest enemy, which is our sin. He is interceding for us. 
He is, he, is, he is interceding for us, not just to forgive us of our sins, but by the power of the Spirit of God that we became, become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is seated, but he's active in a powerful reign. He's active in a spiritual reign. He is active in a priestly reign. But finally, we have Jesus Christ. Even though he is seated, he is active in a judicial reign, a judicial rule. Verse 5 says, The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. There's coming a time when Jesus Christ will no longer be seated. There's coming a time, according to verses 5 to 7, where Jesus Christ will stand. Jesus Christ will stand and he will be sent by the Father to come to earth to receive his bride into himself. He will be sent by the Father to come and to do exactly, literally, what these verses are telling us. He will shatter the kings who are rebelling against him. Jesus Christ will come in his wrath and he will judge those who do not bow the knee to him in this era. In this dispensation, those who refuse to bow the knee to Jesus Christ now will be judged by him one day. That is a reality that the Bible promises over and over and over. But it's interesting. Go to 1 Corinthians 15 as we wrap this up. Let me show you what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. 1 Corinthians 15 ties together with, beautifully, the first verse of Psalm 110 verse 1 when he said to his son sit at my right hand until until I make your enemies your footstool when Jesus Christ returns something is going to change significantly in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15 we read these words but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority in power. There's Psalm 110, verses 5 to 7. For he must reign until he has put, notice that, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus Christ must reign until the Father brings all the enemies under the feet of the Son. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection unto him that God may be all in all. Lots of pronouns. But in a nutshell, what Paul is saying is this. The father said to the son upon his ascension, he said, son, you went and you obeyed me. You fulfilled your covenant. You lived the perfect life for all of those that you died for. You died for them. You rose for their justification. And I am honoring you by bringing you to my right hand. And everyone that you died for, you're going to receive your full reward. And I want you to remain seated here. And I want you to remain seated here and intercede for them until all your enemies are brought under your footstool. And when that happens, then, son, you can go back. And what does the son do? The son comes back. He receives to himself all of those that he died and was buried and resurrected for. He, he brings all those, as it were, to himself. And then he offers them in the whole kingdom up to his father. And the father forever and ever is glorified by the kingdom that was secured by his son. You know, the Bible says that God is love. God is love is not true in any other faith except for the Christian faith. It can't be. Because the, the Muslims believe in a God who is just one. They don't believe in a trinity. You can't have love if it's just a unity. 
You don't have love, but there's someone to share that with. And here you have this beautiful picture of the father who loves the son and says to the son, I want you to go and, 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 to, and to win a people to yourself because I want you to be honored. But the son remains seated at the right hand of the father and he wants to, as it were, stand, not just to vindicate his own, but there's a sense in which the Jesus Christ wants to come and bring this whole thing to a culmination because he loves his father and he wants him to be glorified. It's a beautiful story of love in Psalm 110, the doctrine of the ascension is not just some kind of an academic truth that we should believe in. It is a truth that is grounded in the love of God, the love that God has for God, and the love that God has for his people. Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. Yes, he loves the Father, but he loves all those the Father gave to him. Christian, he loves you. And so even though there's so many things that we're not being delivered from right now, Realize that Christ loves you. We have a good God to her on Sunday night. We have a good Savior who loves us, intercedes for us. And so as we go forth from this time of celebrating the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, go forth with great joy in your heart, Christian, that God loves you in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you for your Son. Thank you for your wonderful work of redemption. We will spend eternity learning about your great love as displayed through the gospel. That will never be an, an old story that grows old to us, always with new vistas to learn. And Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is on your right hand. We thank you that he is seated there making intercession for us. And we certainly would cry oftentimes, how long, O Lord? How long until all things are put right? Lord, may we just be patient as you continue to conquer enemies through the gospel, bring more honor to your Son, and help us to persevere knowing that one day all the wrongs will be put right, all the injustices will be reversed, and Lord, we will forever abide in that everlasting joy because we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and we pray in his name. Amen.